So our next topic is urinary incontinence. Our three most commonly tested on the exam is actually stress incontinence, urge incontinence, and overflow incontinence. And all of these have different mechanisms, so we're going to go over the different ways to diagnose these. And we're going to, we're going to discover the mechanisms and how to distinguish between these, uh, these types of incontinence because different things can cause incontinence. Um, incontinence can happen secondary to autonomic problems such as diabetic nephropathy. Um, it can happen secondary to neurological problems such as stroke, such as multiple sclerosis, such as Parkinson's, and such as our favorite m most common neurological problem which is Alzheimer's disease. So what are we going to do to first diagnose these patients? We're going to first do a urinalysis, all right? And on our urinalysis, we're going to check for infection by looking for bacteria in our urine. We're going to check for glucose in the urine in case they have diabetes. We're going to check for blood in the urine in case they have kidney disease. We're going to check for protein in the urine, which can indicate either kidney, cardiac, or blood disease. Or we're going to look for pyuria, which can indicate an underlying infection as well. So urinalysis is the first thing we're going to do. Another thing we're going to do, post-void residual volume. And we have to do repeated measurements on these patients. And if we have repeated measurements of over 100 to 200 or higher, it's going to indicate an inadequate bladder emptying. And that's going to give us another type of incontinence, which we're going to go over in a, in a second. So your analysis, post-void residual volume on repeated measurements, over 100 to 200 on repeated measurements means there's inadequate bladder emptying. We can also do urodynamic testing, such as cystometry, all right? And cystometry is going to measure the anatomic and functional status of the bladder and the urethra. The anatomical and functional status is tested by cystometry. And if cystometry fails, that's when we're going to go to endoscopic tests, such as cystoscopy. So first we're going to go to cystometry, then we go to cystoscopy if cystometry fails. Another time we can go to cystoscopy is if we have incontinence plus new symptoms such as cystitis and pain, all right? And our cystoscopy is actually going to identify the presence of bladder lesions such as cysts and foreign bodies. And the imaging we can do, x-rays and ultrasounds. And these are also going to evaluate our anatomic conditions that are associated with incontinence. The first one I want to go over, stress incontinence. Stress incontinence is the, probably the easiest and the most commonly tested. Um, it's going to be associated with activity. All right, so these patients are going to lose urine um, when they cough, when they laugh, when they sneeze, when they're exercising, during sudden movements, um, anything that can increase our intra-abdominal pressure and thus increase the pressure of our bladder. This is a type of urethral hypermobility, remember that. Aggravating factors for stress incontinence, obesity, pregnancy, COPD, and smoking. And our post-void cystometry in these patients is actually going to be normal, all right? So our post-void cystometry is normal in these patients. So for aggravating factors of obesity, pregnancy, COPD, and smoking, what do we want to do with an obese patients? We want to make them lose weight, so weight loss. Pregnant patients, what do we do in, uh, in postmenopausal patients? We're actually going to give them estrogen, all right? And COPD and smoking, we're going to make them stop smoking. But our treatment of choice for stress incontinence on your test Kegel exercises or urethropexy. That's what you're going to look for for stress incontinence. We're going to have estrogen in postmenopausal patients, like I said, weight loss and cessation of smoking. And surgical treatment is going to be bladder, neck, suspension, surgery, or birch and sling procedures. So urethral hypermobility, another word for stress incontinence. These are the aggravating factors. Post-void systometry is normal. Treatment of choice, Kegel exercises and urethropexy. And our surgical treatment is bladder, neck, suspension, surgery. Stress incontinence, which I think is the most easy one on your test. Look for the patient that, that's coughing, that's sneezing, that does some kind of sudden movement, and they, they lose urine. Now, urge incontinence and overflow incontinence, it's really easy to remember if you just remember the mechanism. They're actually opposite in mechanism. Our urge incontinence is going to be an involuntary loss of urine occurring for no apparent reason, uh, the patient's going to feel the sudden urge to urinate, urge incontinence, the sudden urge to urinate. And it's most commonly secondary to an inappropriate detrusor muscle contractions. So if we have inappropriate detrusor muscle contractions, what, do we, what does that mean? We have an overactive bladder, okay? We have inappropriate detrusor muscle contractions and urge con, uh, incontinence, which is an overactive bladder. So what do we want to do in these patients? 
we want to inhibit this overactive bladder by giving an anticholinergic. Because what do anticholinergics do? They inhibit the contraction of smooth muscle of the bladder. So if we want to inhibit an overactive bladder, we're going to give it oxybutynin, which is an anticholinergic. Common causes, this is the one I was talking about. Multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's is a huge one, and stroke. So if the patients have a sudden urge to smoke, and they have inappropriate detrusor muscle contractions, I want you to think of urge incontinence. And if the urge incontinence with inappropriate muscle contractions, we want to give something that inhibits the contractions, which is oxybutynin. So urge incontinence, I want you to remember multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and stroke. Neurological problems are going to be associated with urge incontinence, all right? And lastly, we're going to do overflow incontinence. Now, overflow incontinence is where we're going to do our post-residual volume we're going to do a repeated measurements, and it's actually going to have higher than 1 to 200, and it's going to represent an inadequate bladder emptying. Overflow. Overflow means what? Too much. Okay, we have a, a bladder that's too full, and we have a markedly increased residual volume. This is an easy one to remember. If you think overflow, too much in your bladder, bladder's too big, increased residual volume on repeated measurement of post-void residual volume. This is going to be the one that's associated with diabetic nephropathy. It's also associated with tumors, kidney stones, things that block the urethra, and BPH. So it's oftentimes medication-induced, secondary to things like ibuprofen. So what do we want to do? We want to stop the medication. And we want to add bethanocol to improve detrusor action. Because what is bethanocol? It's actually a cholinergic. So we, that's going to improve our detrusor action, uh, activity. And botanicals is given for overflow incontinence to improve the activity. And urge incontinence is too much contraction. Overflow incontinence is too little contraction, while urge incontinence is too much contraction. So if we have too much contraction, what do we want to do? We want to give an anticholinergic. And if we have too little contraction, what do we want to do? We want to give a cholinergic, such as botanical, okay? And if control is not regained, that's when we're going to go to intermittent catheterization.